Uh, welcome to panel two. Uh, I'm Karen Gustafson. I'll be moderating the panel. Uh, and it's an amazing panel. Uh, this is the session on intersectional needs for safety and justice. And I'm just going to briefly uh, introduce the speakers and uh, let them go. Uh, so on my far right, your left, uh, is Donna Coker, a professor at University of Miami School of Law. Uh, her talk is titled Crime Logic and Feminist Politics About Sexual Assault. Uh, next to her is Jessica Cabrera, graduate student here at UCI's School of Social Science. The title of her paper is Interpreting Law in Campus Sexual Assault Response. Then we have Sid Jordan, who is a graduate student at UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs. Sid's title is Critical Trans Perspectives on Anti-Violence Advocacy. And immediately next to me is Natalie Nancy, professor and director of the Hunter Legal Center for Victims of Crimes Against Women at SMU's Dedman School of Law. The title of her paper is The U Visa's Failed Promise uh, for survivors of domestic violence. And with that, I will uh, 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 give the mic over to Donna Coker. Thank you, Karen, and um, thank you, Jane, for putting this together. Um, and um, thank you to all of you for coming. I, um, looking at Mimi's timeline, I realized why my career feels so re-energized. It's like, oh, right, there's so much going on um, after so many years where um, it didn't feel that way. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, what I, what I want to talk about is um, I want to talk about the politics around campus sexual assault and particularly the feminist politics or the way um, feminist politics gets described in um, social media and a little bit about um, the um, influence of that on um, the Obama administration policies, but we live in such a brave new world that I probably won't spend any time, much time on that. Um, so I want to talk about two aspects um, of the narrative, the, the social and public and political narratives around campus sexual assault that get described as feminism um, that I think are problematic. And then if I have some time, I'll talk about what I think would be a better approach. Um, so the, fir the first aspect of this narrative is that I think it's deeply infected with what I would call crime logic. Um, we could, um, that's part of the sort of carceral feminism that we've talked about, but I think it's important to realize that um, when we talk, when I talk about crime logic or carceral feminism, I don't just mean people going to jail and I don't just mean um, a focus on prosecution. It's really rather an approach um, that focuses on punitive kinds of responses. So when I say crime logic, what I really tr am trying to capture are beliefs and attitudes that dominate um, not just our criminal justice policy, but our popular and political responses to interpersonal harm. So uh, for, for uh, kinds of um, uh, right pieces of crime logic would be, one, a focus on individual culpability rather than collective accountability. Two, an absolute disdain and distrust for policy attention that pays any attention to social determinants of behavior. A hostility to the concept of social determinants of behavior. Three, a preference for narratives that feature bad actors and innocent victims. Four, a preference for removing individuals who have harmed others as though excising an invasive cancer from the body politic, um, an expulsion. So I'll give you just one example of crime logic because I want to talk about a second feature of the narratives and I want to spend more time on the second feature. So the, the one example I would um, mention is in the aftermath of the Brock Turner um, sexual assault at Stanford, Stanford University adopted a set of new rules about alcohol use um, to prevent the kind of excessive drinking that both Brock and the victim engaged in um, on, the, on the night that he assaulted her. Now, despite empirical evidence that heavy drinking is associated with sexual assault and that limiting access 
to um, alcohol results in fewer sexual assaults, and, and we can talk about what that research looks like in Q&A if you want. There were some feminist activists who responded negatively to Stanford's new policy. As one activist explained, and now I'm quoting, banning hard liquor sends the message that alcohol causes rape. Rapists cause rape, and they use alcohol as a tool to excuse culpability. So you see both a hostility to social determinants um, of behavior, to thinking about what context might matter, right? But you also see buried in there an issue I'll get to in just a moment, and that's a concept of the assaulter. The assaulter is a rational actor who's using alcohol as an excuse for behavior that he, did, he intended to do. So that kind of rational economic actor is though deterrence is a simple sort of um, uh, system uh, of creating enough punishment. Um, it comes, of course, directly from crime logic, direct, directly from a criminal justice kind of perspective. So the, the second um, area of concern around the feminist understanding or the popular feminist understanding of sexual assault on campus has to do, in my mind, with a paradigm version of sexual assault. And that paradigm um, includes this, a white heterosexual female who has been um, assaulted in, by non-consensual penetration by a male predator. So I want to take each of those in turn and try to unpack them just a little bit. White, heterosexual, female. So there are there is some research looking at male on female sexual assault on campus that finds higher rates among white women. Um, they um, much of that the researchers believe has to do with differences in drinking behavior. White women on campus um, have much higher rates of binge drinking than do women of color in these studies. And clearly, um, binge drinking has a very, very strong relationship with risk for sexual assault. Um, but there are some problems with this paradigm, which I'll, I'll talk within a minute, that go beyond whatever the stance might say. But let me first, let me address a different issue. At least um, two studies and several, um, and, and possibly others, have found very significant rates of sexual assault not for heterosexual women, but for non-heterosexual women. Um, other studies have found high rates for um, gay men. So for the LGBTQ students, both in the DOJ 2016 Campus Climate Survey and in the AAU survey um, that came out a little bit before that, you find very significant rates for LGBTQ students, um, some of them showing higher rates for female students. Um, and, and, the, um, and the numbers on trans students, the numbers are so small, it's really very, very hard to identify, but anecdotally, certainly we're seeing a number of um, um, uh, reasons to indicate that trans students are experiencing high rates. But regardless of what the numbers are, and this is what I want to underscore, this paradigm leads to some really important failures, I think, of feminism. And those failures, unsurprisingly, are intersectional failures. It, it, it leads to a failure to appreciate or investigate the ways that other forms of bias on campus, whether it's homophobic bias, um, anti-foreign bias, and racism and class, intersect both with, or may intersect, because we don't really have the information, may intersect not only with differential risk for experiencing sexual harm, but also differential risk and fear of administrative bias. So both a person who's accused and a person who makes a complaint may be concerned about administrative bias um, along any of these axes and the intersections of these axes. So campus climate surveys, which are a primary tool to gather this kind of information about the climate, um, they typically uh, query about rape myths. Some of them include uh, gender normativity kinds of questions. Some of them include, um, uh, they gather data on homophobic kinds of beliefs. 
But after very thorough research, I found none, zero, that try to gather any sort of data about racialized gender. There are no clandestine climate surveys, to my knowledge, that try to at, that get at hypersexualized images of African American men and women, for example. And yet we know from other studies that there are significant racial harassment issues um, and bias issues on college campuses, as well as bias on, uh, regarding sexual orientation and sexual identity. So that's, just, that's part one of that paradigm, right? White, heterosexual, female. Part two, uh, non-consensual penetration. In fact, both anecdotal evidence from my conversations with um, administrators at several schools, as well, as well as the Yale data that's published about what kinds of um, uh, complaints they're um, looking at, suggest that, in fact, the sexual misconduct claims fall along a real continuum. Uh, penetration is just one, but you have a, a big continuum. In fact, the um, DOE um, uh, Dear Colleague letter defines sexual violence to include at the other end sexual coercion, and a number of campus codes include sexual coercion, and sometimes sexual coercion is defined as um, increasing verbal pressure to have sex. So we're talking about behavior that is clearly not criminal um, and far different in terms of harm, at least I would allege far different in terms of harm, um, than what we normally think we're talking about when we talk about sexual assault on campus. But third, the predator, and this is where I really am going to have to slow down to make sure that I'm clear. So the idea that sexual assault is committed primarily by predators, of course, echoes our um, uh, moral panic around sexual offenders more generally. That's led to segregation. That's led to um, civil commitments post uh, finishing um, a criminal sentence, I, I could go on and on. But what's the data on sexual predators on campus? Well, David Lisek, of course, if, if you've seen The Hunting Ground or if you've read anything about sexual assault on campus, you're likely to have encountered Lisek, who is a primary proponent um, of this idea of predator. His research comes from um, a snapshot review, and what that means, it's a one-time research. You ask um, male respondents, have you ever, since the age of 14, done one of the following things, right? And then each definition would meet a, a definition of rape. And then from that, what Lisa does is to count the number of, oh my, okay, the number of sex acts that occurred, right? Um, and then the number of respondents who committed more than one sex act. So what this does is it doesn't give you any information about whether the acts occurred in one incident or several incidents, and it gives you no sense of change over time, and it lumps um, the second largest group of respondents who committed any rape. First largest, the first group are those who committed one. The second largest group are those who committed two. So it lumps the, that group number two with everybody and says those are all repeaters and only the ones who committed one act or not. Recent longitudinal research by Mary Koss, Kevin Swarthout, and others corrects for a number of the problems with this kind of snapshot research. What the longitudinal research does is to follow st uh, male students from their first year of college all the way through until they graduate. And what this research finds, um, number one, is that most of the men who commit an a, a rape act while attending college do so during a single academic career, a single academic year, I'm sorry, a single academic year. So rather than have a group that commits over time and continues to commit over time, what you find instead is a group that commits in a very limited space of time and then stops. Um, the majority of those who commit are in the very low group, meaning that they committed at one time and then they, they stop. The second largest group, about 5%, of the group who commit any rape at all 
um, are those who go um, down over time. And the smallest group, are uh, uh, representing about 2%, are those who increase over time. So my point here is that actually what you see is a great deal of variability. Um, you don't see evidence for this predator kind of narrative. And, and why do I think that's so important? I think it's so important because it's part of, it hides the kind of um, differences that exist between acts. Um, it suggests um, that a predator suggests that the only thing a campus can do is to expel and get rid of. It closes any opportunity for thinking about changes in behavior um, and what universities might do. Um, and it shuts down any sort of nuanced narrative and I think means that for a number of people who experience um, sexual misconduct, they are forced to choose between I'm either a victim of a predator and the only rational um, um, response would be to punish that person, get rid of that person, or I must not have been victimized at all. So have I got 30 seconds, Jane? Okay. So um, I mean, we could talk about this in Q&A, but I, I, think, I think what we need is a public health kind of response. Um, that does pay attention to um, these determinants of behavior, but it needs to be an intersectional public health response. Um, that means paying attention to these intersections of both vulnerability, um, but also of campus um, bias and administrative bias. And um, in the paper from which it's drawn, I argue that restorative justice can be a useful part of such a response. And I, I won't have time to talk about that now, but maybe in Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, so I'm a second year in the sociology department. I'm in the PhD program here. Um, and so actually the title of my presentation that's up here is different from the one that's on the program because when you're a graduate student, your research changes week to week. Um, and so this is where I'm at right now, but as a sociologist, um, I study structure and I think that uh, these presentations will tie in quite nicely from what, I'd heard, what I've heard. So I study um, university employees responding to campus sexual violence and I pay attention to unclear roles and two familiar categories. And you'll figure out what that means in a second. Um, but you were talking about the narrative of bad actors and innocent victims. And here we go, okay? So when I was looking in the media, I saw all these narratives about um, Title IX administrators basically overstepping their mandates. They're out there telling people that they need to be rapist hunters, that they need to go hunt down any allegation of sexual violence on campus. Um, and then so there's like this hysteria in the media. And we also get these terms, actually there's a Harvard professor, some of you maybe are familiar with her, but she writes about the Title IX system becoming the bureaucratic sex creep and sort of micromanaging student sex lives um, and things like that. And so we sort of see this hysteria. And you know, so I saw a couple of things going on and I wanted to investigate. Um, so my first question was, okay, are university employees actually overstepping their mandates? Um, let me go into the field and see what's going on. And then more broadly, um, I identified um, three policies that require action out of university employees to report. So it's not necessarily that all three of these policies apply to every person, but maybe you know, uh, at least one applies um, to some of, some of the employees that I talked to. Um, so how are reporters who all, you know, any three of these um, policies, I'm going to call them reporters, even though they actually have three different names. They're uh, responsible employees under Title IX, campus security authorities or CSAs under the Clery Act, um, and mandated reporters uh, under state law. And so when I went to the sociological literature, I was sort of finding some, some things that sort of mirror, you know, not exactly what's being said, in the media, but um, they kind of, you know, have, they kind of allow for the same thought process, which is that, so I, I was reading this um, literature on what's called street level bureaucrats, which describes the lowest level, um, you know, workers in a bureaucracy. So that could describe school counselors, police officers, teachers, um, roles like that. And that's what I want to study. So I, I didn't actually go out and talk to uh, Title IX officers or central administrators. 
Um, I did have informal conversations so I could get an idea of what was going on, but for the sake of my research, I wanted to look at how street-level bureaucrats in the university setting are figuring out what they're supposed to be doing. And um, so in this literature, it sort of theorizes that, um, you know, there's all these policies for street-level bureaucrats, you know, regardless of what organization they're in. They're usually totally confused about what the policies actually say. Um, and with all this ambiguity, it gives the street-level bureaucrats a lot of discretion. And with that discretion, they expand their scope of action. And so that could be a similar thought process to what we see in the media. Oh, if they have all this discretion and all this ability to um, interpret what they're supposed to be doing, then they're overstepping their mandates. Um, but um, I went into the, into the field, um, and so I did a series of interviews. So I was interviewing teaching assistants, professors, and counseling and medical professionals, um, all sorts of people. I'm sort of leaving out some of the names of the roles to uh, you know, maintain anonymity, but um, I also did policy analysis of the three policies that I mentioned before. Um, and then, of course, was coding and doing uh, qualitative data analysis like that. Um, so what I ended up finding was sort of almost the opposite of this narrative that we see in the media. Um, so first of all, people, well, it, this is not so different, but people were pretty much confused. And they were, respond, they were calling all of their duties mandated reporting, whether that was they were a responsible employee, they were a CSA, or they were actually a mandated reporter. They were calling everything mandated reporting. And this was just confusing people as to what policies they were supposed to be responding to and what procedures they were supposed to be following. Um, and then, you know, I was talking to people and they would say, oh, you know, the policy is so unclear, the policy is so unclear, and I'd say, okay, well, why is the policy unclear? And the more I probed about it, I actually realized that people were more unclear about their roles at the university because people hold multiple roles under multiple bosses, uh, multiple superiors at any given time, that it was actually more that the policy wasn't accounting for, um, people's lack of clarity on what their roles were and when they were supposed to be um, following what rules when. And I'll go over that more in detail because that's very abstract. And so to start, um, you know, I, I talked about um, people called everything mandated reporting. And so there was actually something more to that. It, just, it wasn't just that, you know, they were calling everything mandated reporting and they were confused on the procedures, but People rely on what's familiar to them. And so people were relying on this idea um, of mandated reporting in, in, in education as in not the university, but as in, uh, you know, like high school education or, or primary education. Um, they, so they were relying on their knowledge of those mandated reporting policies to inform how they thought Title IX operated in terms of procedures um, and in terms of its, you know, its goals. And so, um, title, uh, sorry, mandated reporting um, is supposed to be an intervention in the lives of children in the event of abuse, or elders, but children was more relevant to my research. And so when I asked people why they might not agree with Title IX, you know, being a responsible employee, which they were calling mandated reporting, they were saying, well, it treats survivors like children. Um, and their agencies being taken away. So this is the reason that people almost didn't want to comply with Title IX was because they thought it was like mandated reporting in terms of its uh, idea. And then the other issue was people were not clear about their roles. So when you go to the literature, people talk about role conflict and role ambiguity, which means um, basically people move through spaces, they have roles that require incompatible behaviors, um, and requirements change across roles, and then role ambiguity means um, people are not really sure what they're supposed to be doing, what their duties are, who their bosses are, who's holding them accountable to things, um, the allocation of time given roles, and the relationships with others. So I'll give a few examples. So um, given the structure of the university, people have actually so many roles. So in the literature, a bureaucrat is just one person in one position, and there's a hierarchy, and they report to one boss, um, and that's an ideal bureaucracy setting where things can, hand, can, can uh, be carried out efficiently because um, there's just such an organized system. Well, the university totally doesn't work that way, okay? So, um, so yeah, you can have one employee who occupies one job in one you know, subsystem, so a professor working in a department. 
But you also have employees who, multiply, uh, who occupy multiple jobs in their subsystem. So you can get maybe a professor who's also the department director. So there's, they're occupying two roles. But then you get, you, you get employees who occupy multiple jobs across subsystems. So this is hypothetical, but um, I did find people who occupied this many roles. Whoa, excuse me. But you get uh, you know, a teaching assistant, uh, someone who volunteers at their domestic violence center, and then you get a union worker. And they're all three, and they have bosses according to those roles. Um, and so it's very complicated. And then um, you also have employees who belong to more than one organization. So you might have someone who is, um, you know, they work for the university, they're a professor in the Ar Army ROTC, but because they're part of Army ROTC, they also belong to the military as an organization, and there's separate reporting procedures for sexual violence um, for the military. And, and so, um, you know, to wrap up that point, um, people have all these roles, they have bosses in all those roles, and then on top of that, they have, you know, maybe another organization or officer who um, is supposed to be holding them accountable to following Title IX policy or mandated reporting policy. So at any given time, you have so many superiors, and it's so hard to really maintain accountability. But then you also have people who experience um, ambiguity in their roles. So they don't know when their roles begin and end, and their roles are not defined by time and space. And given that, they can't figure out what their formal versus informal roles are. And so um, this is an example of someone I interviewed, and they said, well, the Title IX policy is ambiguous. It's ambiguous, you know? When is a TA on the clock, and when's the TA off the clock, right? You see, the studio at a, you see a student at a party, um, you know, what, somebody else that's on the campus, another student that's on campus, you know, do you take your TA hat off? So people don't know when they're supposed to be acting formally or informally, and that impacts how they, um, how they act and whether they decide to report. And so um, people are also um, sort of lacking clarity uh, on authority in response procedures, like I said, because um, individuals responsible for policy compliance are not the direct superiors of university employees and the rest of their work duties, and they already have so many superiors because they already have so many roles. Um, and to wrap it up, uh, you know, the interpretation of Title IX through prior categories, mandated reporting, leads bureaucrats to see it as overly demanding because they're relying on what's familiar. But I did want to say that whether people were um, sort of protesting their responsible employee duties or complying, they all cared about the rights of the survivor. And so it was just people taking these different angles based on the knowledge that they knew on how to do the right thing for the survivor. Um, and then finally, role conflict and ambiguity uh, makes people unwilling to take action. Um, so they're not actually the rapist hunters imagined in the media. A lot of these lower level, um, street level bureaucrats are actually um, hesitant to make decisions um, because they have so much going on. So thank you. Hi, good morning. Is this thing, yes, it is working, okay. Um, so I am here um, to be the immigrant voice um, on the panel and to speak with you today about um, the U visa, which began as sort of this great hope for assistance to survivors of domestic violence and um, what I argue has, has actually failed them and made them less safe. So um, I don't want to presume any knowledge, so just very, very briefly, a U visa um, is a form of immigration relief for somebody who has been a victim of a crime here in the United States. There's a long list of enumerated crimes. Um, domestic violence and sexual assault are among them. Um, the person has to have suffered substantial physical or mental abuse as a result of having been a victim of that crime. And importantly, um, has to demonstrate that he or she has been helpful to law enforcement in the investigation or prosecution of that crime. Um, with that third element, critically, um, the, the person who's applying for the visa has to submit a uh, certification form signed by a uh, local, state, or federal law enforcement agent, a police officer, a prosecutor, a judge, um, basically to demonstrate that helpfulness. Um, and it's, it's an absolutely essential part of um, that immigration application. So to the point that when um, the immigration officer receives it, if that form isn't in there, they 
literally like take that packet and they turn it, they return it immediately. They won't even open it, right? So it's an absolutely critical piece um, of um, this U visa um, application process, which again highlights um, the significant weight that is placed on cooperation with law enforcement in order to, to access um, this form of eligibility. Um, the U visa, if you are able to receive it, is um, quite beneficial. Um, it takes somebody who is either undocumented or um, has a temporary immigration status and provides them a visa that's valid for four years. Um, they're eventually able to take that visa and transition it into a green card or lawful permanent residence. They're provided with work authorization in that duration and they can um, include um, derivatives or family members on that application. So spouses, children, um, for ch child applicants, their parents. Um, so it's it's a really, um, in theory, um, a wonderful way um, for for immigrants who are at risk to regularize their immigration status, and really that um, was the whole idea behind this visa. It was created um, by Congress in 2000, and and the thought behind it was um, that there's a recognition um, that. Uh, immigration status um, can be a significant barrier to reporting crime, right? So the idea is we're going to bring immigrants out of the shadows by saying, if you come forward, if you uh, explain to law enforcement that you have been victimized, then um, you can be provided this lawful immigration status and you won't have to risk deportation when, when um, coming forward to report a crime. Um, it, I should say that uh, the U visa, it, although it is technically gender neutral, so the list of crimes are not just um, crimes that, that predominantly occur um, to women. The, there's just a long list of, of sort of murder and kidnapping and those things that are gender neutral. It, the visa really has, um, from its origin, been inextricably intertwined with the fight against gender-based violence. So it was, um, it was, uh, it, created as part of the, of the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Prevention Act, which is the uh, 2000 reauthorization of VAWA. Um, and it was specifically in the Battered Immigrant Women Protection Act, right? So again, despite the fact that it is available more broadly, it really is linked um, to this fight against domestic and sexual violence. The legislative history that I read all of is replete with references um, and statistics about domestic violence generally and um, the disproportionate impact that intimate partner violence has um, on immigrant populations. So um, when the U visa was created, Congress said we really, we have two, two goals here, right? Um, we want to protect victims um, and we also want uh, to provide a benefit to law enforcement in that um, immigrant victim participation in the system, in the criminal justice system, will lead to more arrests and safer communities. So that was, that was the, the stated purpose um, of Congress when creating this visa. Um, those two aims were purportedly co equal, um, even the victim is always sort of, the victim protection piece is always listed first, um, but uh, it doesn't it take a lot to see, and hopefully I will be able to convince you um, at the end of my 10 minutes that um, those aims were actually squarely in, in conflict. So the receipt of, of the UVSA, as I've mentioned, is conditioned on compulsory and continuing cooperation with law enforcement. Um, and as we've started to see today, um, that the, the desire to engage with the state in that manner uh, doesn't actually reflect the reality of the lives of many immigrant survivors of domestic violence. And so requiring that cooperation has ironically made an immigration relief that was specifically created to help immigrant victims a source of, of increased uh, risk and danger. And so the argument that, that I make in my, in my paper is that the incompatibility of these goals really should not have come as a surprise to anyone um, because this, this coercive interaction with law enforcement that exists in the U visa, it really stems from and is analogous to a long line of mandatory interventions um, in the lives of survivors of domestic violence that have proven inadequate in protecting and and supporting them.
So I want to speak very, very briefly um, about um, mandatory legal interventions. Um, I'm going to go be quick because we've already talked about it a little. I think we're going to talk a lot more. And I think probably 90% of the people in this room are experts in this area. So um, as you know, we have mandatory arrest. Um, as we already heard Professor Kim speak about this morning, we have no drop prosecution. And really, those were enacted um, in response to um, I, I love, I'm like referencing that timeline, right? So remember the beginning of the timeline, right? When we ignored domestic violence, right? We thought it wasn't a societal problem. So the pendulum swung all the way over here to, to um, require these mandatory interventions that at this point are, are pretty ubiquitous. Um, states were encouraged to adopt these policies with the enticement and the promise of VAWA funding. So, so they, um, they, they're, they're, in every, in every state, and we're seeing them, again, stemming from, from those Wisconsin studies and before. Um, they have been soundly and roundly critiqued over um, the course of, of the decades that have followed, again, by many of the people who I am looking at here in the audience. Um, so uh, we the, a lot of the critiques center around um, the deprivation of choice and agency that can be extraordinarily disempowering and harmful to survivors. I always like to steal Jane, you said this morning, I'm so glad. This idea of um, what these interventions do is they supplant um, the abuser's control with state control, right? And so that that obviously um, can be very damaging. Um, we have survivors that, for many reasons, um, are disinclined to be involved with the criminal justice system. Obviously important to the conversation that we're having here on this panel um, is that intersectional identities, right, um, race, sexual orientation, and class um, significantly impact uh, people's attitudes towards engagement with the state. Um, and also that many survivors make um, very informed choices to not seek um, outside intervention in their marriage. The story that we heard from Professor Weissman this morning Right, um, especially if separation is not your ultimate goal, um, especially if you have other countervailing concerns, um, family, economic, um, it may be that engagement with the state in this way is, is not perceived to be in your best interest and it's not something that you seek to do. So um, that's the 30 second um, mandatory intervention speech and uh, what I do wanna say is that I do recognize that um, the U visa is technically not a mandatory intervention, right, in the way that mandatory arrest is, right? But um, essentially, you know, with the U visa survivors do retain the choice of whether or not to seek the U visa and therefore engage with law enforcement, or um, the other alternative is to remain in the shadows um, without lawful immigration status. Um, but I think um, the argument that I make in the piece is that it certainly can be described as a very, very coercive choice, right? If not mandatory, and to some people, um, it might feel very mandatory, right? That, that it is in the spirit of the mandatory interventions that, that preceded it. So ultimately the problem um, with the U visa and why I argue that it has failed um, immigrant survivors is that by requiring survivors to cooperate with law enforcement, the benefits that Congress intended for um, police and prosecutors are achieved at the expense of the victims that Congress also sought to protect. And also and importantly, that the very vulnerabilities that the U visa was intended to address um, are exacerbated um, by this engagement with the system. And it's especially problematic uh, because battered immigrant women face unique challenges and obstacles um, to engagement with law enforcement. So I will talk about those also um, very, very briefly. Um, Obviously, language barriers are significant, so immigrant victims may not be aware of certain services, or um, they, not may, they may not be able to access those services in the same way um, that native speakers can. Um, there is an obvious fear um, and distrust of law enforcement in immigrant communities. Um, this may be because of experiences that women had in their countries of origin where either um, domestic violence is condoned or um, there are state actors who, um, even though domestic violence is, is unlawful um, on the books, are don't don't help when, when they're called out to do so. Um, there is um, inequality and bias in policing here in the United States as well we all know, and important here um, to the topic of immigration, um, and I'm bleeding a little bit into the next panel about um, 
trumps America is that local police um, have often long been synonymous with immigration enforcement. The U visa was really intended um, to just break to break that connection a little bit to say that um, your local police are not here to ask about your immigration status. But what we've seen in the last few months is um, the president signaling an intent to increase reliance on programs like 287G and secure communities and programs that, that deputize local law enforcement as federal immigration agents, again, making um, sort of bringing these two ideas together again and making immigrant victims very fearful to come forward. Jane referenced this morning the stories of survivors who are being arrested in courthouses or being asked about immigration status when they're coming forward to report crime. And so I think to the extent that we made a little bit of progress over the last few years on, on helping with this distrust of law enforcement problem, um, it's, it's all really kind of gone to hell in the last few weeks. <laughs> so um, lastly, thank you. Well, that's my quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, and lastly, um, family fracturing and economic consequences for immigrant victims um, can be very problematic. Um, many of the U visa eligible crimes, domestic violence, stalking, protective order violations are deportable offenses, right? So if an immigrant victim calls uh, to report that again, um, saying, I really don't, don't necessarily want serious consequences, right? I don't want somebody to lose their job. I don't want the entire community to, to weigh in. Like the, the, we heard of the case of the sheriff this morning, um, I just want this person to stop hitting me, maybe be removed from the home. A call to the police can result in deportation. Um, the, uh, the economic consequences of that um, can be incredibly severe, especially if that, um, that partner is a primary bedwinner. The family fracturing, right? I, I want this person to not hit me, but I don't want them to never be a part of my child's life ever, right? So there are these huge barriers that immigrant women face. Um, in, um, in engaging with law enforcement to begin with. And once they do, um, some of these unintended consequences may, may occur. <coughs> so, um, not to be a total naysayer, I, I end with just a few potential solutions to this problem. Um, we've seen that the U visa sort of as is, is not um, achieving the goal it was intended to, um, to aid survivors. So there are all kinds of different options that we have, right? Um, there is immigration relief under the Violence Against Women Act Act, um, that allows for a solely humanitarian benefit um, to survivors of domestic violence, right? Relief that's not contingent on um, engagement with law enforcement. Um, you're basically entitled to relief if you can prove that that you um, have been subjected to battery or extreme cruelty and then meet some other um, relationship-related criteria. Um, there are opt-outs in other areas of the immigration law um, for um, certain survivors. So in the U visa context, we could very well create opt-outs for survivors that are either too traumatized to engage with law enforcement, for those whose safety or security would be compromised um, by reporting or cooperating, or for victims that can demonstrate that a law enforcement agency arbitrarily or unreasonably refused to sign off on that certification form. And you see um, similar opt-outs for the T visa, which is uh, for survivors of human trafficking, and also actually, weirdly, in the U visa adjustment, which is the, the, the process by which people that have U visas get green cards. So these type of opt-outs already exist. Um, there's certain things that we could do um, in terms of training um, and regulating to provide um, at least a certain level of um, regularity um, to um, the way that these certification forms are issued. And then there's been a ton of stuff going on in the states, actually, most significantly here in California, that requires law enforcement agencies. Yeah, I saw somebody applauding you <laughs> in California. Um, and there's similar bills in Maryland and Minnesota and Washington. There's something going on in Nebraska, of all places, um, in the city of New York. So a lot of local agencies that are, or it's lo local entities and state entities that are that are trying to um, to find ways to, to make law enforcement at least do this a little bit more fairly. So um, the last thing, just to conclude, really, is that in the benefit of hindsight, it probably should have been very obvious that the U visa's humanitarian and law enforcement aims were really incompatible. Um, and if the U visa fell into this trap of requiring survivors to cooperate with law enforcement in order to achieve safety, um, and my hope is that the solutions proposed here will help mitigate those effects and really recognize, again, because this is this is the intersectionality panel, 
to recognize that the different that different different victims are different. That's my other winning quote, right, <laughs> from from this panel. That the protections that police and law enforcement can provide are helpful to some, um, but not necessarily appropriate for others. And that because immigrant victims are very differently situated, we need to find nuance um, to mediate the detrimental effects of um, this forced state interaction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we don't have uh, all that much time, and uh, um, I just want to um, note some of the commonalities, though this is a, a panel on differences. Um, uh, most of you touched on uh, um, beliefs that protective policies that have been put in place and savior figures um, uh, in uh, movements against violence are in some ways contributing to uh, vulnerabilities. Um, most of you also touched on uh, the disconnect between popular consciousness about <clears throat> uh, violence and uh, actual experiences of violence on the ground. Um, uh, so there are commonalities across uh, the intersections, um, but I'm wondering if, uh, Nancy has done this really already, but if the first three um, uh, uh, who, uh, and most of you ran out of time in talking about remedies, um, could um, come up with one or two things that would help the communities you're most concerned about. And maybe we could start with Donna. Um, sure, I have to switch classes again. Um, so, so I think one, um, an intersectional public health kind of approach um, would look at the research on the um, strong, uh, the strongest correlates with um, sexual assault on campus. And let me underscore that almost all of this research, the very few exceptions, is um, male victimization of women. We, we really have very, very little research on, um, on uh, men who are victimized. Um, so, though, so if you look at that research, really sort of three things come out um, as very salient. One has to do with um, peer support and hostile masculinity. So peer support meaning um, that one, um, uh, that respondents say on surveys that I believe my peers feel in these particular ways about women, right? That they hold hostile attitudes towards women. Hostile masculinity um, is found in responses to questions like um, um, women frequently are trying to um, lead you on, women try to get you in trouble. That kind, those are the kinds of questions you see on those surveys. And then the third um, finding that I've already mentioned is alcohol consumption, which, has a, which is hugely correlated. Um, so I, I, so my, my view is um, a public health response would look at those three kinds of um, issues and do that not only in prevention, which is happening some, but not nearly enough, but in response to individual cases. And this is where I think if I'm making contribution, it's in that regard. And, and that's where I think um, um, efforts like restorative justice, not only restorative justice, may be very useful because that gives you, it can give you a vehicle, an organized way in which to address the kinds of factors in the um, context in which abuse happens and to try to change those factors for the individual who caused sexual harm um, and then also have an impact on the rest of the school. Um, for those of you who don't know about restorative justice, I'd encourage you to look at uh, Dalhousie University in Canada. There's a wonderful report on the use of restorative justice in a sexual harassment case that sort of lays it out uh, from beginning to end, So, which I don't have time to do, I'm sure. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, um, I think that asking uh, sociologists for solutions is sometimes very overwhelming because we study just enormous structural issues and then are just lost in it. And um, so, but I think that um, my research sort of gets at maybe two issues. One is that um, 
you know, we have policy and um, people are, people feel that policy is unclear because it doesn't address lack of clarity in their roles. Um, and then we have the second issue, which is that, well, the policy isn't the cause of these unclear roles. It's really within the structure of the university. And so I feel like um, those are big undertakings. I'm not, you know, neither of those is easy, but I think either, you know, the policy needs to find some way to recognize that people at a university do hold multiple roles and when are they in those roles and when are they out of those roles. And I realized actually reading a guidebook um, from the Clary Act that there is, a, there is a section on dual roles and what to do and, and offer scenarios and how you can um, act in those different scenarios. And so maybe that's, that's a potential solution is um, putting, you know, uh, making Title IX policies, uh, um, uh, being able to, to account for dual roles, but obviously you can't account for every person's situation in the policy. That's way too big of an undertaking. And then I think the other issue is, you know, especially, I mean, I'm a, I'm a teaching assistant too. I don't know when we clock in and clock out and when we act formally and informally. Um, and maybe there's some way to make roles, you know, positions at our university um, more easy to, d to define in terms of in time and space. But that sounds like a really big undertaking. So that's the sociologist perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Next slide. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, I'm gonna lean on the amazing thinkers that I had an uh, opportunity to interview to answer that question and also just say I'm really narrowing in on community-based DV SA organizations um, in doing so. So one of, the, one of the big things we heard was just we need people that look like us doing this work. And I don't mean to say that there's one way of looking as a trans person, um, but that that was really very highly stressed. And even in um, how few people we were able to identify for the study, it's clear that we don't have people um, doing this work, um, or enough enough of us. Um, trans leadership in the field more generally, and people just spoke to needing, like convening spaces to build that leadership, needing resources to even bring people together um, to talk about the stakes of what it means to do um, work with, um, work on partner violence and sexual violence in trans communities. Um, and uh, I think, the other thing we heard a lot about is um, what one person called the give up in the movement around cultural change work, um, or even just prevention, which was put in quotes. Um, but, and I saw this in the field for, for sure, there's just very few resources to do that work among community-based agencies. They don't get funding for that. Um, but that's actually where people had a lot of energy about what, where we could do work on all those various things that sort of fuel the, the dynamics of violence that I spoke about earlier. Thanks. Would you like that? I mean, yeah. Oh, Donna, go ahead. No, I was just just listening to said makes me um, calls me up short and makes me uh, remember that the other thing um, I should have said was a lot more work on these um, intersections that I talked about and gathering, um, both in terms of the research, um, um, but also in terms of the activism on campus and the um, the different organizations that, um, and students who are involved in responding. Okay, good. Oh, and actually, I just want to say, because Mimi brought it up earlier, almost all my respondents had some inner relationship to some of the countervailing forces that Mimi mentioned earlier. And I, w I wanted to say that because a lot of them mentioned alternative frameworks as a, as a big need and direction for them. They called that different things, maybe transformative justice, we are healing justice, definitely community account accountability. Those were the kinds of conversations that the people we talked to, even though they were in some of the mainstream programs, were excited about, energized by, and, and wanted more of. Yeah, great. Well, I guess, again, leaning on, on my interviews and my own experience, I would say that um, collab building real collaborations with trans organizations, because many people who are experiencing violence go to trans like political organizations or support groups who often are volunteer run and don't have resources. And those groups are the ones trying to make referrals for people to places to go. So building real relationships between um, your organization and those groups is one, a direct referral, but also can help you know, your organization think about other ways of, of acting in solidarity too. So I guess I would. Yeah, would be my number one.
Um, so I, I think that the, the, the promise of thinking about this through a civil rights violation lens is a very powerful kind of lens. And, and, um, and, and it's part of what is disappointing and disconcerting to me um, that so many um, people who, and, who define themselves as feminists have, um, to me, have not exploited the possibilities of thinking about this from a civil rights perspective and instead have sort of incorporated this punitive kind of response. Um, and, and of course, you know, the Trump administration, um, and, and the, look at the Republican platform, they want to send all these cases to the criminal system and um, they would prefer to close everything down. So that's exactly what I think will happen. So this question about what campuses can do is ripe, right? Um, there's both the possibility and the, and the real um, problems. So um, a, a response that, what you want is a response that both um, has a normative component that, um, that says it's, there's a moral issue, it's morally wrong to um, take advantage of someone who's unable to um, act in their own um, best interest, that clearly that that's wrong. Um, and you want a response that um, has more nuances and realizes that actually there are complaint, there's sexual harm that cases that happen and complaints that don't fit that pattern. Um, and someone can be harmed without someone else being morally culpable, that that's also a possibility. Um, and so that there's this range. Um, and I think that's where um, I think that restorative justice can offer something. I don't think it's the end all be all. I, I see it as part of a much sort of bigger process. But um, restorative justice processes used in sexual assault cases require first that the complaint, I mean, the, um, the, the person who ha is accused of having con uh, committed sexual harm um, um, agrees that he or she actually did that conduct, right? So from a criminal law perspective, they don't have to admit to a mens rea. They have to admit that they did the conduct at least. Um, and before that can even begin, and of course both parties have to agree and so forth. And some of the programs um, that I think are the most powerful include um, support, may include supporters depending on what the, the people want. Um, so um, having um, someone who's a part of a conferencing um, circle who, has, who comes prepared for that meeting and who's able to talk about the harm and how the harm impacted um, the person who was harmed, um, and to give that person the opportunity to say directly um, in a somewhat structured environment how the harm affected them, I think is actually a much stronger level of accountability um, than, than the campus processes. The other thing that comes out of, or can come out of a restorative justice process are, um, is an agreement that in can include, for example, rehabilitative kinds of measures, uh, but also can include measures that change the social environment. So um, um, measures that, for example, have um, a person who is involved in an, uh, a high-risk male organization, um, it, perhaps part of Greek life, and I don't, they're high-risk and low-risk here, I don't mean to say every fraternity, um, may be a part of changing the dynamics in that fraternity or changing the alcohol policy. So it, it, it takes both the individual and also can have a, um, an effect on the larger um, uh, kind of culture. One of the most interesting pieces of research on RJ um, that I find is Heather Strang's, where they found that um, Restore, and just in terms of measuring recidivism, which would not be my only measure, but in terms of measuring recidivism, lower recidivism in the violence cases than in the property cases. And why is that? Strang thinks it's because of that face-to-face -face kind of dialogue where someone realizes the impact that their conduct had um, on someone else. Okay, okay. We are out of time. I want to make sure the next uh, panel has enough time, but thank you all. This was a terrific panel. Um, I look forward to this. <laughs>